Greetings all, my name is Stephen Cook and today I want to address the subject of is self-defense biblical? Is self-defense biblical? And uh, this is a subject that I wrote on a few years back and uh, recently revised an article uh, a few weeks ago which I posted on my blog and so I will post a link in the description below for any of you that would like to have access to this article which is what I'm going to be working through. We will be chasing down a number of scripture references but I will post a link in the description below for any of you that would like to have access to that. So are Christians biblically justified to use force for self-defense? Depending upon the situation, the answer is sometimes yes and sometimes no. We find an interesting passage in Exodus chapter 22, verses 2 and 3, where killing a thief is both justified and unjustified depending on the situation. It's an interesting passage. Moses says in Exodus 22, 2, If the thief is caught while breaking in and is struck so that he dies, there will be no blood guiltiness on his account. Uh, now, what we're about to learn is that this thief is breaking in at night. So if he's breaking in at night and he's caught, the homeowner confronts him, and he's caught while he's breaking in. And, and being nighttime, being dark, the homeowner doesn't know the thief's intent. He doesn't know if he's coming in empty-handed or if he has a, a weapon in his hand. He doesn't know if the thief is there just to steal property or to, or to take life. Uh, he doesn't know that. So the homeowner, he strikes the thief so that he dies. Well, Moses says there will be no blood guiltiness on his account. That is, he's innocent of taking this other person's life. Verse 3 says, But if the sun has risen on him, there will be blood guiltiness on his account. And it could be that uh, if it's daytime, the homeowner can see the thief. Maybe he's smaller in stature maybe and not a threat. Maybe he's not wielding a weapon. Maybe there's other people present or with an earshot if he, if he cries out for help. So the daytime changes the situation. John Hanna, who wrote the commentary on Exodus in the Bible Knowledge Commentary, which is a good commentary set. It's a two-volume set, but I, I do recommend it. It's, it's a good set. But John Hanna says, If a thief burglarized in the night and was killed by the owner of the house, then the defendant was not guilty of murder. But if the burglar was killed during the daytime, so that the house owner, he said, but if the burglar was, was killed during the daytime, the house owner was guilty of homicide. So apparently the day thief could be seen and help could more easily be obtained. The last comment he makes here, he says, the Mosaic Code sought to protect human life, even that of criminals. I find that pretty interesting. I thought that was worth sharing. Now, in Scripture... Uh, throughout Scripture, there are examples of believers who at one time defended themselves or others, but, but then at other times fled uh, and or suffered for their faith. David, for example, who killed Goliath, and you can read about that uh, historical account in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 17. And in that situation, remember, David goes out onto a field of battle. It was during a time of war, and David goes out uh, onto the field, and he meets Goliath, and with a sling and a stone... Uh, he brings the giant down. He plants a rock nicely in his forehead, and he knocks him cold. And then David goes over and takes uh, the sword, and he beheads Goliath. So he kills him. And David's absolutely justified in that situation. However, David, who killed Goliath, twice fled when Saul tried to kill him with a spear. Uh, and then later on, David refused to retaliate even when he had opportunity to attack Saul. The two accounts, uh, uh, one is in 1 Samuel 18, 11. And uh, prior to this, if you go back and you read 1 Samuel chapter 16, verses 14 through 16, 1 Samuel 16, verses 14 through 16, you read in all three of those verses in there uh, where Saul uh, came under divine discipline. And it says in all three of those verses that the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul and an evil spirit from the Lord was sent to terrorize him. So Saul has this evil spirit terrorizing him, and he's under divine discipline, and apparently it's, it's causing some form of mental madness. And Saul, while he's in a state of madness, uh, tries to kill David, and that's what 1 Samuel 18.11 is, where it says that Saul hurled the spear 
that is at David. For he thought, and here was his murderous thought, I will pin David to the wall. Now, Saul threw this spear, and he must have thrown it with a good amount of force, because it's going to go through David, excuse me, it's going to pin him to the wall. But it says here, but David escaped from his presence twice. So Saul tried to kill David twice, and in both situations, rather than retaliate, uh, or defend himself, David just simply fled. He led, He left the situation. You see the second account in 1 Samuel 19.10, where it says, Saul tried to pin David to the wall with the spear, but he, that is David, uh, slipped away out of Saul's presence so that he stuck the spear into the wall and David fled and escaped that night. So David opted to just simply get out. He just simply sought to get away from Saul, and he had a way of escape, and he, and he chose it. Now, later on, and you can read about this in 1 Samuel 24, where David refused to retaliate. So even though Saul tried to kill him, David refused to kill Saul because he recognized that he was the Lord's anointed, and he said, I'm not, I'm not going to touch him. God can deal with him, and God is dealing with him, but I'm, I'm not going to touch him. He's in, the, he's in the hands of the Lord. Uh, so you can read about that. Now, later on, we have some examples about uh, believers who suffered for their faith. And we don't have anything in the context here where they sought to defend themselves. And by the way, in these first three examples, we have examples of justified civil disobedience, where you have believers uh, who are defying uh, governmental authority. And listen, when the government issues a command that directly contradicts God's commands, then the believer has not only the right, but the duty to say no to that human authority. And it's not that we're throwing out authority, it's just that we're adhering to the highest authority, which is God's authority, and we'll talk about that here more in just a second. Uh, now, in the book of Daniel, we learn about three Hebrews, three Hebrew youths, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, otherwise known as Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael, that we learn about three Hebrew youths who opposed a tyrant and accepted the possibility of death by fire. It's a very interesting section here, because what you have is you have um, where uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, along with Daniel, were brought into captivity as a result of the Babylonian exile that took place in 586 B.C., and we don't know where Daniel was in the midst of this. He could have been away on some diplomatic mission or something, or perhaps exempted from this uh, particular command. But nonetheless, the king, King Nebuchadnezzar, issues this command that all the citizens of his kingdom must bow down and worship this golden image, this statue that he has erected. And uh, idolatry was one of the big sins that brought Israel into captivity, because they had... Uh, practiced idolatry for, for years, uh, even centuries, and on some occasions uh, even sacrificed their own children. I mean, that's how bad uh, the idolatry got. So anyway, you, hear, you have all these people, including tens of thousands of Israelites in Babylonian captivity. Now, what's interesting to me is all of, you have to ask, where were all the other Israelites? Because uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they remained standing while everybody else was face down in the dirt, uh, sucking dirt in compliance with the king's edict. And so here's these three Hebrews, and they remain standing, and they're in defiance of the king. So the king uh, thinks, he, well, maybe they don't understand, so he gives them a second chance. Well, in verse uh, 16, you see the response, and it says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter. Uh, they said, If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. I love verse 18. But even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to bow, that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you've set up. And so they just simply tell the king, look, give us a chance. Don't give us a chance. We're not bowing down to the golden image that you've set up. Now the king, Nebuchadnezzar, gets furious. He has them thrown into the fire. God does protect them. You can read about that in the rest of the story. Uh, but the point is, is that they accepted uh, the suffering. They accepted the possibility of suffering for their faith. Uh, Daniel, in Daniel chapter 6, chose to face death 
<clears throat> in a den of lions rather than cease his prayers to God. Uh, Peter and John and other company defied the command to stop preaching in the name of Jesus. You have this account back in uh, Acts chapter uh, uh, 4 where you have the Sanhedrin uh, where they tell uh, Peter and John, it says, and when they had summoned them, by the way, uh, the, the apostles, when they were sent out, remember in Matthew 28, they were sent out with the Great Commission uh, to go out and to make disciples of all the nations. So they are to go out and to share the gospel and to raise up disciples, right? To teach people to know the Lord and to walk with him. And, and so they're under divine orders, uh, to do this. Now, this comes into conflict with uh, some of the leadership uh, in Jerusalem at this time. And so the human leaders come in, uh, the Jewish leaders come in, and they, they tell them, they, they say, look, you need to stop doing this. Well, anytime you have a command that is antithetical, where you have a human command that is antithetical to God's command, then at some point you have to submit to the higher authority. And so again, you have not only the right, but the duty to say no to that human authority when it contradicts the authority of God. But in Acts 4, 18 through 20, it says, And when they had summoned them, they commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John, and they, they, they knew, okay, now, now, now there's a conflict here. But Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God, you be the judge. For we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. And they did go out. They were threatened. And that's what sometimes abusive powers do, tyrannical powers. They, they threaten people. And uh, Peter and, and John and company, they go out and they preach. Well, this creates a conflict, and then they're called back in to stand before the Sanhedrin council. Um, Acts 5.27 says, And when they had brought them, they stood, before, they stood before the council, and the high priest questioned them, saying, We gave you strict orders not to continue teaching in this name. And yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and intend to bring this man's blood on us. Um, but Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than men. And so it's an issue of submitting to a higher authority. Uh, and then later on, after they had stood against the council, the council decided to have them flogged. Uh, they beat them with a whip. Again, this is ramping up their tyrannical uh, abuses. In Acts 5.40, it says, They took his advice, and after calling the apostles in, they flogged them and ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and then release them. Uh, so they went on their way from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for his name. So the point that I'm getting at here is there are examples in Scripture where believers were willing to suffer and did suffer because of their faith. Okay? Uh, and even Stephen, when he was being stoned to death, offered prayers and forgiveness for those who stoned him. Paul, interestingly enough, avoided a murder attempt by escaping through an open city, uh, by escaping through an opening in a city wall, as he was lowered to safety in a basket. And so again, here we have a situation where, where his life uh, was in jeopardy. And rather than confront uh, his attackers, rather than confront those who wanted to kill him. Uh, he just simply sought to remove himself from the threatening situation. In Acts 9, 23 through 25, it says, When many days had elapsed, the Jews plotted together to do away with him. But their plot uh, became known to Saul. Uh, they were also watching the gates day and night so that they might put him to death. So this is an attempt. They want to kill him. Okay, They want to kill him. But notice how they handled it. Verse 25, But his disciples took him by night and let him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a large basket. Uh, so rather than confront uh, those who wanted to kill him, Paul simply escaped uh, into the night. Uh, and we learn from other passages that Paul accepted unjust persecutions, beatings, and even imprisonment for Christ. And you can read about that in 2 Corinthians 11 and 2 Timothy 2. Interestingly enough, even Jesus did not fight against his accusers and attackers, but willingly laid down his life. He willingly laid down his life. In fact, in John 10, 15, Jesus says, even as the Father knows me and I know the Father, and I laid down my life 
for the sheep. I lay down my life. Jesus was willing to go to the cross and to lay down his life. And he says in verse 18, no one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. And so when Jesus was going to the cross, and by the way, Jesus wasn't murdered. Uh, He wasn't killed by crucifixion. Jesus willingly went and endured the beatings, endured the illegal trials, endured the crucifixion. And while he was on the cross, the biblical text tells us that he just simply breathed out. He exhaled, did not inhale, and he simply gave up his spirit to the Father. And Jesus had the ability to lay down his life and to take it up again. And he says that. He says, no one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again, this commandment I received from my Father. Uh, So again, Jesus did not fight against his accusers and attackers, but willingly laid down his life and died a substitutionary death on a cross for our sins. When asked about his kingship and kingdom, Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. Later, when Peter drew a sword uh, to defend Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus stopped him, uh, and we read about this in John 18, 11, where Jesus said, Put the sword into the sheath. The cup which the Father has given me, shall I not drink it? Uh, So the Son of God really had the means to defend himself. I mean, come on, he's God. Let's be honest here. He could just, all this could have stopped in a nanosecond, right? So it's not like he lacks the means uh, to protect himself. So the Son of God had the means means to defend himself in the Garden of Gethsemane. uh, And he says in Matthew 26, 53, he says, Do you not think that I cannot, cannot appeal to my Father, and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? Well, 12 legions of angels, and if you take a legion to be 6,000, which is the common number for a legion, uh, then you would have roughly about 72,000 angels, which would have been more than adequate to fight against Jesus' attackers. Really, one angel could have shut the whole thing down, but again, we're talking about the Son of God. uh, And so Jesus had the means to stop it, but he didn't. Uh, So we know that it was not the Father's will that Jesus be defended, either by angels or men, but that he suffer and die for his sins. This was for the Father's glory and for our benefit. Because if Jesus had not gone to the cross, if he had not died in our place and borne the punishment for our sins, then we we would be forever damned. We would not have any hope of forgiveness or eternal life or the gift of righteousness or any of these things. So it was uh, for the Father's glory uh, and for our benefit. And the world is not worthy of those who suffer and die a martyr's death for the cause of Christ. Now the question gets brought up, should Christians be pacifists? Should Christians be pacifists? Now there are Christians who love the Lord Jesus and take his word seriously, and we always should take his word seriously, when he says, do not resist an evil person, but whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other to him also. Now this verse used to puzzle me when I was a kid. Um... Uh, and so I've, I've heard people use this verse as a, as a key verse uh, to advocate for total pacifism. And so I raised the question, is this a call for Christians to practice total pacifism? Norman Geisler, uh, who passed away a few years ago, and I like Geisler, he's, he's quite a, a Bible scholar. Uh, he says, quote, biblical arguments for total pacifism are flawed. For example, Jesus' command to turn the other cheek refers to a personal insult, like a slap in the face, not to bodily harm, end quote. So the point here is that a slap in the face is not a life-threatening situation. Uh, And so in this situation, turning the other cheek means tolerating the abuse. Now, I agree with Geisler on this matter. Overlooking a personal offense can be very difficult at times, But this is what we are called to do. This is what we are called to do. Uh, And I've got a footnote here on this if you want to look at that later. Now, the Apostle Paul said in Romans 12, 17 through 19, he said, quote, Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. 
Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. End quote. Now, as growing Christians, we should have a calm or cool spirit, not be hypersensitive, exercise self discipline, control our emotions, and learn to dismiss an insult. Uh, a key verse that has really helped me, and this, when I was much younger in the faith, about 30 years ago, I, I really struggled. I, you know, like a lot of young believers, I had my, my issues. But one of the ones was taking offense, you know, uh, when other people would issue insults. And Proverbs 19.11 was a, a key verse for me, uh, where Solomon said in Proverbs 19.11, quote, A man's discretion makes him slow to anger. And it is to his glory to overlook an offense. Let me say that again. A man's discretion makes him slow to anger. And it is his glory to overlook an offense. And listen, there's much in the world that is offensive, whether you're on the highway, whether you're watching TV, the news, politics, uh, people you work with. I mean, there's lots of room for being offended by things or people in this world. Uh, But the Bible teaches us uh, that here that a man's discretion makes him slow to anger. That's a compliment to him, because uh, he's responsive and not reactive. And he says, and it, is, and it is to his glory to overlook an offense. Now, is killing the same as murder? Killing is not the same as murder. Murder is the taking of a human life for unjustified reasons. And under God's law, uh, he says, the murderer shall surely be put to death. Now, God authorized killing. He did authorize killing, the taking of human life, when he told Noah in Genesis 9, 6, Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God he made him. End quote. And what we learn is that throughout the scripture is that God himself has killed. God himself has killed. In fact, you think of examples like Leviticus 10, 1 through 3, where Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took their respective fire pans, and after putting fire in them, placed incense on it, and offered strange or unauthorized fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. And it says, And fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. So God himself takes human life. 2 Samuel 6 Uh, You have this encounter where you have uh, David who's returning the ark back to Jerusalem, and he's doing it on a cart. That's not how it was supposed to be done. It's supposed to be carried by by the Levitical priests, by the Levites. But nonetheless, you get to this point where there's a a bumpy spot in the road. And uh, verse 6, it says, it says, But when they came to the threshing floor of Nakon, uh, Uzzah reached out toward the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen nearly upset it. And the anger of the Lord burned against Uzzah, and God struck him down there for his reverence, and he died there by the ark of God. So you have these examples where God himself uh, has killed. He takes life. And, uh, and in fact, we know uh, that in the future, during the time of the tribulation, God will kill again. I mean, you can think of even the return of Christ in Revelation 19, at the second coming of Christ, I mean, he is going to put down all rebellion, uh, human rebellion that rises up against him at the Battle of Armageddon, and he will uh, he will kill all who are in opposition to him, and he must put down rebellion. He'll put it down both in the demonic realm and in the human realm, because he's going to establish his kingdom upon the earth for a thousand years. Now, God's law for Israel uh, listed specific violations that warranted the death penalty, And if memory serves me correct, uh, there were 613 commands in the Mosaic Law. And out of those commands, I believe it was 15 uh, warranted the death penalty. And that right there tells you that there were, uh, that not all violations uh, were the same, that some were more egregious than others. Uh, But under the Mosaic Law, there were certain ones that warranted the death penalty. And though these are few in number, they clearly show that killing is not wrong in God's sight. But if, a, but if an offender displayed humility, God may grant a reduced sentence. And God's directive for capital punishment really continues on even into the New Testament. We read uh, in Romans uh, 13, 4-6, uh, where it talks about good government, 
notice I said good government, is a minister of God to you for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid, for it, that is government, does not bear the sword for nothing. For it is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. And so bearing the sword here uh, is a reference to capital punishment. I'll mention that again here in just a second. So um, if you know me, you know I'm prone to repetition. Uh, so good government's right to kill. When doing God's will, governmental rulers are to be respected and obeyed, as God has granted them the authority to kill for just reasons. Stating this passage again, For it, government, is a minister of God to you for good, but if you do what is evil, for it does not bear the sword for nothing. The sword is a picture of capital punishment which God sanctions by means of the governments of this world. Capital punishment is necessary to exact justice for those who have been innocently murdered and to deter future acts of evil. Killing is justified when God commands it. Now, certainly there are rulers who abuse their power for sinful purposes and at times need to be resisted. Civil disobedience is a valid biblical concept. Wisdom and courage is needed here. And examples you can think of in Exodus 1 and 2, where the midwives refused to kill the newborn babies, Daniel 3, Daniel 6, Acts 5, other passages I've already referenced. But you do have legitimate cases of civil disobedience mentioned in the Bible. So, uh, for the most part, governments serve as a minister of God, and for this reason we submit ourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as the one in authority, or to governors is sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right, uh, according to 1 Peter 2, 13 and 14. Furthermore, governments employ and empower police and military as a means of restraining evil, and this sometimes requires force, even deadly force. Good government will adequately fund and support their police and military. And if a Christian is called into police or military service, then he may be the one who wields the instrument of punishment to accomplish God's will. In this case, he needs to be the best police officer or soldier he can be, and this for God's glory. So let's look at some biblical examples of self-defense. In Genesis, we read that Abraham uh, fought against Ketoleomer, uh, in order to defend the innocent and restore stolen property. We have an example there where Abraham, where Abram, his name's changed to Abraham later, but here he's Abram, that he does defend the innocent uh, when he goes out to fight against Ketoleomer and to restore stolen property. We have an example where David used force to rescue his family and belongings from the Amalekites who destroyed and plundered the city of Ziklag. Uh, now, what's interesting here is that we realize, and other passages of the Bible make it clear, that David was a man of war. And David had actually spent years developing his martial skills. And what's interesting is that David even blessed God for the military skills that he had received from the Lord. Uh, one example is over in Psalm 144, verse 1, where David says, Blessed be the Lord my rock, who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle. That's a very interesting passage, isn't it? Blessed be the Lord my God, who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle. Another passage is in Psalm 18, verse 34, where it says, He trains my hands for battle so that my arms can bend a bow of bronze. And so David here is praising God as the one who enabled him to be a powerful and effective soldier. And uh, the Bible's very clear on these issues. Now, in the book of Esther, uh, we learn about a man named Haman, who in Esther 3.6, we learn, sought to destroy all the Jews. Uh, this is an evil, evil form of anti-Semitism, which we see rising today in the world. It's always been present, but it seems to rise at certain points. And I think we see it in our day as well. Now, by deceit, Haman convinced King Ahasuerus, King Ahasuerus to pass a decree that would allow him to kill all the Jews. 
and the king uh, blindly passed this law. Now, what's interesting is God did intervene, even though God is not mentioned. His, uh, his hand is present throughout the book of Esther. And later, Haman was hanged on the gallows that he intended for the Jews. Uh, so justice is served. Uh, and later, King Ahasuerus passed a second law, which, according to Esther 8.11, granted the Jews who were in each and every city the right to assemble and to defend their lives. Now, don't miss that. The right to assemble and to defend their lives. And when they came under attack, Esther 9.5 tells us that the Jews struck all their enemies with the sword, killing and destroying. Now, that is an absolute rock-solid example of self-defense, uh, where they used the weapon of their day, a sword in this, in this situation, uh, to kill those who sought to kill them. This is, this is a form of justified killing. Now, the sword was the weapon being used against the Jews, and the sword was used by the Hebrews to defend themselves. This was clearly self-defense. Later on, when Nehemiah was rebuilding the city wall in Jerusalem, both he and his builders were under threat of attack. Nehemiah split his forces between defenders and workers. Excuse me. We're told in Nehemiah 4.16, where he says, Half of my servants carried on the work, that is, of rebuilding the wall, while half of them held the spears, the shields, the bows, and the breastplates, and the captains were behind the whole house of Judah. So we have an armed guard present. Uh, later on, notice what he says here a few verses later. It is said of the builders themselves in Nehemiah 4.18 that each wore his sword girded at his side as he built. Uh, so these were men who had a trowel in one hand while they're building the wall, and they have a sword at their side ready to defend themselves. Again, clearly these swords were for self-defense. And I suspect it also served as a psychological deterrent to anybody who came by because they're thinking, okay, these guys are these guys are ready for action. You know, they've got their weapon on their hip. We've got these other people in the background armed and ready. And so sometimes the visual is enough of a psychological deterrent to dissuade somebody from coming on. Uh, and that's important to understand. There's always a psychology that goes into attackers, even people that break into a home. Listen, most criminals think in terms of risk versus reward. And if you raise the risk, uh, then the reward uh, diminishes as a result, and people say, okay, well, it's too high of a risk. I'm not going to go in. I know uh, on my home, I have cameras around my house, but I have, a, I have signs on, on my front door and my back door and on windows uh, that say, uh, this house uh, under camera surveillance. Uh, I have a few signs that say, uh, beware of owner, with a little picture of a gun barrel pointing at them. That's just a psychological deterrent. Now, the reality is, is there, there is actual um, means of self-defense uh, in the home. But what I want to do is I want to uh, deter the criminal as much as I can with those psychological barriers. And so put up those signs, those cameras, uh, those things that basically tell them, uh, look, there's a likelihood that you'll get caught if you come into this home. Uh, and this is what I think is going on here, where, where you have these swords that are being girded at their side, where you have the soldiers in the background, you have a situation where people that see that, that that's going to deter them. So again, it's a good psychological deterrent. Now, again, clearly these swords were for self-defense. Now, Jesus, toward the end of his ministry on earth, told his disciples in Luke twenty-two thirty-six, 36, whoever has no sword is to sell his coat and buy one. Isn't that interesting? Whoever has no sword is to sell his coat and buy one. Quoting from Norman Geisler again, he says, quote, while Jesus forbade his disciples from using a sword for spiritual purposes... Uh, he urged his disciples to buy a sword if necessary for protection, end quote. Uh, and one other point here, we shouldn't always think in terms of just physical defense, of having some weapon by which to defend ourselves, uh, whether a sword or a firearm or whatever it happens to be. There are other means of defense, and sometimes legal defense is the preferred course of action. 
Uh, there's an example in Acts 16 where Paul, who at one time, uh, we see in Acts 16 where Paul, who at one time took a beating, he did take a beating. In fact, in Acts 16, he was stripped naked, he was humiliated, he was beaten with rods and thrown into jail. Uh, all illegally, mind you, because that's what mobs and uh, tyrants do. Uh, they seek to intimidate, but Paul was not a man to be intimidated. Uh, he was not going to be deterred. He was going to continue on in Christian ministry. And uh, those sorts of tactics didn't work on him. They really shouldn't work on any Christian. Uh, but nonetheless, Paul in Acts 16 uh, took a beating with rods. But later on, in Acts 22, verses 25 through 29, Paul used legal force against his attackers or those who were about to uh, flog him by exercising his rights as a Roman citizen to protect himself from a flogging that might have killed him. In fact, uh, let me go over there. It says, but when they stretched him out with, with thongs, that is Paul, Paul said to the centurion who was standing by, is it lawful for you to scourge a man who is a Roman and uncondemned? Well, see, it was a, uh, you, you couldn't do that. And so Paul knew that. And so when Paul mentions this, uh, he says, he's basically telling this, this soldier here, look, I'm a Roman citizen, and uh, under Roman law, I have the right to a trial. And are you going to flog me without a trial, a man who is uncondemned? And notice when it says, when the centurion heard this, he went to the commander and told him, saying, what are you, what are you about to do for this man is a Roman? And the commander came in and said to him, tell me, are you a Roman? And he said, Yes. And the commander answered, he said, I acquired this citizenship with a large sum of money. In other words, he purchased his citizenship. But Paul said, but I was actually born a Roman citizen. Uh, and then it says in verse 29, therefore, those who were about to examine him immediately let him go. And the commander also was afraid when he found out that he was a Roman and because he had put him in chains, because that was illegal. And the commander here could have gotten in a lot of trouble for doing that. So my point is, is that Paul defended himself legally, and that was the means of deterring the threat of harm. So, so you see what's going on here. There's more than one way to defend oneself. And later on, Paul eventually appealed to Caesar in Acts 25, hoping to gain a just trial. And Christians can certainly use le the legal system as a means of protection, certainly. Uh, now, it's just, interestingly enough, I wrote an article that was published in the uh, Journal of Dispensational Theology a few months ago, and the article uh, was titled, um, A Survey of, of Mobs and Riots in the Bible. A Survey of Mobs and Riots in the Bible. And I go through and look at about 10 different examples, I think it was 10, of where mobs and riots occurred in Scripture and how they were handled. And there's various responses to it. It was a fascinating study. I enjoyed doing it. But I lifted this example out of that article, uh, and it shows a non-lethal use of force. A non-lethal use of force. Now, in Genesis, we see an example of a non-lethal use of force to neutralize a threat. And you can read about this in Genesis 19. I'm just going to hit the high, the high points here. So Lot, while living in Sodom, had received some male guests... Uh, we learn later on that they were actually angels... that he welcomed into his home... However, there were men in the city who came to Lot's house and demanded that he turn out his male guests, uh, to turn out his male guests so they could have sexual intercourse with them. And it's likely that these men in the city intended to rape Lot's guests. And the text tells us before they went to bed, the men of the city of Sodom, both young and old, the whole population surrounded the house. Um, and they were saying, where are the men who came to you tonight? Send them out to us so we can have sex with them. Now, surrounding the house and making demands was an intimidation tactic designed to cause fear. And we see that today. It's no different. You watch mobs and riots. You watch how they, and they form a mob and they'll gather around a property and they will seek to uh, do that as an intimidation tactic. They're trying to cause fear. It's a power play is what it is. It's a power play. Now Lot tried to reason with them, and he said to them, Don't do this evil, my brothers, even wrongly offering them his two daughters in place of his guests. It was horrible what Lot offered. Uh, but in the moment, that's what he did. 
Now, the men of the city then demanded Lot get out of their way, and Genesis 19.9 tells us that they put pressure on Lot and came up to break down the door. So now they're resorting to physical force. They're going to try to break down the door uh, to get in to get these men. So when the men of Sodom did not get what they wanted, they resorted to force and tried to break into Lot's house. And this mob would certainly have committed a great evil against Lot and his guests, but fortunately, uh, Genesis 19.10 tells us that, that the angels reached out, brought Lot into the house with them, and shut the door. So they reached out, they grabbed Lot, uh, by his collar, and they lifted his feet off the ground, they yanked him into the house, that's what I visualize anyway, and then they shut the door. Now, since the mob was not rational, and by the way, mobs aren't rational, and that's why they have to be dealt with sometimes by means of force, since the mob was not rational, the angels were required to use force. Genesis 19.11 says, So they struck the men who were at the entrance of the house, both young and old, with a blinding light so that they were unable to find the entrance. Now that's interesting to me because these angels could have killed them. They could have killed them all, but they didn't do that. They used a non-lethal form of, of force to neutralize the threat. So they struck them with blindness. Now here we witness the angels employing a measured use of non-lethal force sufficient to stop the men of Sodom from advancing. Now, we know that this was a temporary use of non-lethal force until such a time that God could render fatal judgment on the city as a whole. And what's interesting is when, they, when the angels blinded uh, the men who were advancing on the house, they then took Lot and company and got them out. So they got them out of the city. They removed them from the threat. And listen, if you're walking through a neighborhood and you see a riot, turn around, go the other way. Just avoid the conflict. If you can get out and just avoid the conflict altogether, get out. If you can use a non-lethal means of force to protect yourself until you can get out, then do it. I mean, you have options that are available to you. Lots of options that are available to you. So though the actors were angels, it still demonstrates an example. It still demonstrates an example of non-lethal force used to neutralize a threat. And I just, I find that quite fascinating. Now let's talk about Americans in self-defense. Now, law-abiding, responsible Americans have the right to own a firearm for self-defense. It is a constitutional right. I would argue it is a biblical right first. It is a God-given right first. But it is nonetheless an American right according to the Constitution. Uh, so this is our constitutional right according to the Second Amendment of the United States of America, which declares, quote, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, comma, the right of the people to keep and bear arms, comma, shall not be infringed, end quote. Now, there is no conflict between Christianity and our constitutional right as Americans to own guns for protection and self-defense. I think it was a few months ago, I was watching a lesson uh, by Dr. Andy Woods, and I watch a lot of his lessons. I like him. He's a good teacher. But he was giving a lesson in which he was talking about the uh, founders, the framers of the Constitution, who wrote the Constitution and Bill of Rights, that if you study their literature, and I forget the book he referenced, um, but anyway, uh, in it, it, he pointed out that somebody had done some research, and uh, when you read through their writings, uh, the writings of the Founding Fathers, the framers of the Constitution and Bill of Rights, you learn that about 34% of their writings reference back to the Bible. And the other sources that they reference were men who operated by a biblical worldview. Now, we realize that not all of the founders were Christians in the ideal sense, and some probably weren't Christians at all, but they operated within a biblical worldview and within a biblical value system based on the values, the ethical norms and standards set forth in the Word of God. And so, uh, very much it resonates when you read through the Constitution, when you read about our Creator uh, giving us unalienable rights, uh, that there are certain things that we have that come to us from God and not from man. And since God gives them to them, then people didn't give it and people can't take it away. It's ours by divine right. So there is no conflict between Christianity and our constitutional right as Americans to own guns for protection and self-defense. 
Wayne Grudem, and I like his quote here. I, I love Grudem. He is, a, he is a good Bible scholar. I disagree with him on his ecclesiology and eschatology and a few other things. But overall, I like his writings. He is a, he is a good scholar. And I like his quote here. Uh, he states, quote, A gun is the most effective means of defense in all kinds of threatening situations, especially against attackers who may be stronger or more numerous. Protection of the right uh, to own a gun is especially important in areas of higher crime or more frequent violence, end quote. And I agree. I think that's absolutely right. Now, I would say that if you don't like guns as a means of self-defense, and I know people who do, I know people who, who don't have guns, they don't want to be around guns, they think guns will just, you know, go off, and listen, if I had a firearm and I, and I loaded it and I had a, a, a round in the chamber and I cocked it and I were to set it down on my table, and assuming that nothing tinkered with it and it just sat there on the table, listen, I could come back a thousand years later and you know what? That gun would still be on the table. It would still be loaded. It would still be cocked and, and no harm would be done. Okay. Guns don't, <laughs> guns don't kill people. People kill people. Guns are just a means by which they kill people. But, you know, this idea that you're going to go after the gun is, is just, anyway, that's another issue. But I tell people, look, if you don't like guns as a means of self-defense, then by all means have some protection whether pepper spray, a knife, a taser, or whatever increases your ability to neutralize a threat. Having an alert mind, that's, that's very, very important. Being aware, situationally aware of your surroundings, what's going on, people, how they're dressed, how they're behaving, what's going on, that situational awareness. Having an alert mind that pays attention to your surroundings is, I would argue, your best defense because it allows you to see the threat and if you can get out, get out. Avoid the situation altogether. And also, as I mentioned earlier, it might be helpful to use psychological deterrence to keep criminals away from your home. Uh, for example, keep the outside of your house well lit. Install cameras, even fake ones, because cameras, because criminals can't always distinguish between a real camera and a fake one. Post signs on your property that say uh, that it's managed by a security company or signs that say you'll use force if needed. For most criminals, there is a risk versus reward mentality, and they are often deterred from committing crime if they think the risk of being caught, injured, or punished exceeds the prospect of reward. Now, I understand this assumes some rational thinking, and I realize some cr criminals engage in harmful behavior without thought or fear, uh, perhaps because they're impaired by drugs or, or a mental disorder, and uh, you, you, know, you do what you can. But I would say that if you can put up psychological deterrence to keep criminals away from your home, you know, that's great. Again, it's about safety. It's about safety. So in summary, there are times when using legal force is justified and other times not. God sanctions justified killing, but not murder. God has granted good governments the right to kill, both as a means of, of exacting justice and deterring crime. Both as a means, um, well, both as a means of exacting justice and deterring crime, and there are clear examples of believers in Scripture who used lethal force as a means of protecting themselves from unjustified attacks. Furthermore, God Himself has killed and will kill again, and non-lethal uses of force may also be used to neutralize a threat. Lastly, law-abiding Christians in America have the right, uh, have the constitutional right to keep and bear arms as a means of self-defense. So I did not cover everything in this short presentation, but I hope there was enough here to persuade you uh, concerning the biblical understanding of the right of self-defense. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, please put them below in the comment section. I do reply to those. If you like this presentation, then please hit the like button. If you would like to, to receive other lessons like this, then be sure to subscribe to my channel, and that way you'll see when they get posted. I thank you for taking the time to watch or to listen to this lesson, and I wish you a blessed day.